My pain was pretty bad. It was really difficult to, to live with the pain, just wondering, is it always going to be like this? I was at the point where I was in pain every day. How am I going to have a baby? What are my chances of fertility? It was very hard for me sometimes to get out of bed. When you're in pain every day, it, it makes you tired. It doesn't. You don't want to do anything. You don't feel like being with anybody. I just had so many questions and no one really understood what I was going through. It was to the point that I isolated myself because it was so bad. And I knew that I couldn't keep living like that. That was not quality of life for me at all. I was in a lot of pain one day and um, I was in class and the pain got so bad that I couldn't move. I called my dad and they took me to the emergency room and I was in the emergency room all day and they finally figured out that a cyst was on my left ovary and that it had ruptured. So they just assumed that all the pain that I had been experiencing up until that point was the cyst. I had my kidneys checked, my appendix, my liver. I had CAT scans and MRIs and ultrasounds and just every test that you can think of, I had it done. They couldn't find anything. So then they told me that the pain was psychological, that you know they could not find anything medically wrong with me. That became very frustrating to me because I knew that the pain that I was experiencing was not psychological. I continued to see other doctors. I had my first surgery, which was in July of 2005, and they removed endometriosis from both of my ovaries, my uterus, and my pelvic lining. about 15 or 16, I started having really bad menstrual symptoms. Um, horrible, horrible cramping, uh, fatigue, bloating, all of those symptoms. And it was so bad that I would miss school occasionally. And so my parents took me to the gynecologist and she basically said, some women have pain. She gave me some over-the-counter pain medicine. And that went on for years, pretty much my whole life. And in the back of my head, I knew that that was not normal. But I went to multiple doctors over the years and they all said the same thing as, it's just part of being female. Some women have it worse than others. Um, nobody ever suggested that there was anything wrong or that it could be fixed. Um, nobody really treated me, um, like I said, over-counter pain medicines and things like that, but nothing significant. And I just continued to go through life um, kind of accepting that it was part of my life. And when I moved back to Virginia, I found a new doctor who had just opened a practice here in Harrisonburg. And I went to her, not expecting um, to hear anything different, but when she asked me about my history and I told her, she was the first person that said to me, I think this, there's something going on here. I think that maybe you have endometriosis. And when you get tired of dealing with this, let me know because there's things we can do. And that was life changing. I, first of all, finally had a diagnosis of something that I, knew was wrong but nobody would confirm um, and second of all the fact that she said something could be done about it just blew me away but when I found out the something that could be done about it was surgery I wasn't quite ready to jump in uh, so she said that's fine take your time when you get tired of this come back to me and so a few more months went by and more pain and more frustration and I finally just one day had had enough and called her and said sign me up for the surgery I, this has to stop basically I went in for surgery and um, it was a couple hours and when I woke up she said that I had stage 4 endometriosis and the next course of action was that I went on Lupron shots after the surgery and was on those for about six months and then after the Lupron shots she put me on a low estrogen birth control pill which I'm still on today. My periods got to the point where I was having probably 12 or 14 day long periods. It was so bad that I would have nausea and even vomiting. 
um, constant diarrhea, and I'd miss several days of school at a time. So it's at that point I knew it wasn't normal. Around the same time, uh, when I was about 19, my 16-year-old sister was having a lot of the same problems and spoke to our gynecologist about it, and she had a laparoscopy done and was diagnosed with endometriosis. I figured that since I had the same symptoms she did, if she had it, then I must have had it as well. My sister's laparoscopy with our local gynecologist went well, but she still had a lot of the same symptoms, and hers got to the point where she was just in constant pain and knew she needed help. She got to the point where we were researching online to try anything we could find, and we were really hesitant to try a second surgery since her first one didn't really have the effect that we were hoping for. But then we found Dr. Albie's website, um, decided to take a chance. She went down and had her surgery, and she had such tremendous results that I knew that I could be helped as well. I started to examine what it was that I wanted to do in the field of GYN and to even see if I could survive. I was actually given an opportunity to go out to Bend, Oregon to work with David Redwine. He was able to take me to the operating room, show me the patient's post-op, take me home to his home to show me his data on his computer. Uh, I was easily convinced that the information he was giving me was accurate, which made me feel like uh, if I could learn to do what he was doing surgically, I could have the same success that he was reporting. Endometriosis is a condition or disease affecting 13-14% of women. The tissue that makes up the lining of the uterus, um, endometrial glands and stroma, grow outside of the uterus and it typically causes pelvic pain and or infertility in, in cases in which it's more advanced. The main symptoms are so varied that it's really a task to get them nailed down. The things that we commonly are aware of are painful periods, backache, change in bowel function, pain with urination or bladder symptoms, pain with exercise, with examination, with intercourse. Painful periods is something that's common among women in general. Um, it's, well, it's really women who have severe side effects from that painful you know, uh, periods or dysmenorrhea that are the ones who likely have endometriosis. One thing that Dr. Albi explained that was very interesting to me was your symptoms of endo and your, the severity of the endo growth don't always correlate. There are some women who could be stage 4 endo but show very few symptoms and others who have very severe periods but their endo may only be a stage 1. So for women out there who have any type of discomfort with their periods, whether greatly severe or even minimal, do get checked out because it doesn't necessarily correlate with how much endo you may have growing inside. Each person's symptom complex seems to vary most with where their disease is, and since their disease is pretty much always in its own unique places for them, um, then the symptoms are going to vary accordingly as well. Typically we feel that uh, you know teenagers probably start having the symptoms of endometriosis fairly early on, uh, probably beginning from the time they start having periods for the majority of women. We diagnose it in the office primarily on history and certainly physical exam adds things which w can be helpful. The only way to actually make that diagnosis is by seeing the, the, you know, the endometriosis in the pelvis and to actually confirm the diagnosis you actually have to test it and have a pathologist look at it to confirm that. I would say that in the operating room we generally know whether it's endometriosis or not. I was diagnosed with a late stage 2 endo. Um, I had endo on my bladder, on my bowels, my ovaries, outside of my uterus, pretty much everywhere within my abdominal cavity. Um, they actually told me if I'd waited another three to five years to have surgery, I definitely would have been infertile, that the endo would have grown to that point. Since having surgery, I was on birth control pills for a while. I recently got off birth control pills. My periods are now under seven days, and I haven't had any heavy days of periods at all. My cramps are minimal, manageable. I can go to work. I haven't missed any school or work. A lot of the symptoms have resided, don't have the diarrhea or any of the um, other bowel problems I had before. It's just my periods are very light, very manageable. It's really a world of difference. I am really glad that I was able to see Dr. Albi as young as I did at 21 because I firmly believe if I had waited I would have developed into a stage 3, stage 4, e even higher at stage of endo and that I really would not have been able to have children so I'm so blessed that I found him so young. After 
my first surgery, um, I did have pain relief after six months or so. My symptoms started coming back. I had my second surgery in November of 2006, so it had been 18 months from my previous surgery. Uh, they found the endometriosis was still on both my ovaries, my pelvic lining, my uterus. He named an area called the cul-de-sac. The endometriosis was still in the same places. You, you, we see it day in and day out, you know, women who've had multiple surgeries, basically the same surgery done every time where the doctor's gone in to try and just destroy the endo, and the endo keeps coming back in the same places time and time again. It, it would be different if the endo came back in other places, but the fact is it keeps coming back in the same areas that have been treated every time, which tells us it's how we're treating the disease is the problem. I would say that my symptoms of endometriosis started when I was almost 14 when I had gotten my first period. I remember having horrible back pain, um, lower pelvic pain, um, and it just progressively got worse over the years. I would miss school two or three days out of the month. Ultimately, I went to another gynecologist who said, we may try things that have been done already, but if you think you've got pain, then you've got pain. And in February of 98, he did the first laparoscopy. And that's when I was diagnosed with stage two endo. I don't feel like they understood how much pain I was talking about. I, I feel like they thought, yeah, cramping is a part of the menstrual cycle, women have it. I don't think they, they really realized that, I, I feel like I have a high tolerance of pain and, and it was crippling me. I, I would lay in bed and I would miss days of work, I'd miss days of school. I, I mean, it was severe pain and I, I feel like maybe, and maybe it's my fault for not communicating it very well, but I feel like most of the doctors I went to didn't understand that what I was talking about was something that was interfering with my life. I had been on Lupron prior to even having that first laparoscopy. That was before I knew anything about anything. And, you know, the doctor said that patients that are stage one or two usually respond effectively. So we opted the Lupron first. When that stopped working, we then did that first surgery where I was diagnosed. Um, continued me on Lupron. A month after that surgery, the pain was back. Everything was back. It was as if nothing had been done. And then I thought, you know what, I've got Dr. Albee down the street, what am I doing? So I went to him and in June of 98 he diagnosed me as an early stage 4. Dr. Albee even went in on that second surgery and he said the areas that he treated, he treated well. It was just because of being on Lupron, there were areas that couldn't be seen. drug therapy simply because they're all simply temporary forms of control of the symptoms and they don't treat the underlying disease. Therefore none of those things really treats the disease. They are all what we call palliative measures. I had run across a lot of people that said yeah that they had had multiple surgeries and on and off Lupron and, and I remember my doctor had said that as well. She said Sometimes the first round of Lupron doesn't work, and sometimes you get off it and things come back and then you go back on it. When I was on the Lupron, the first month I was great. I didn't have any pain. Um, the mood changes didn't even start then. Probably in the second or third month is when I would cry all the time. Um, I would yell at people for no reason. Um, as I said, my cousin went to the doctor and even said to him, please take her off of it because none of us want to talk to her anymore. It was that bad. We went on a treatment of Deprolupron for six months. It was probably the worst six months of my life. <laughs> um, in the first three weeks, I probably gained about 15 pounds. I had uncontrollable mood swings, hot flashes, headaches. Um, it, it was not a good experience at all, and it's a treatment that I would not do again. My symptoms were relieved for a little bit, but it didn't last. It, it slowly, like after the first surgery, the symptoms slowly started coming back again. I did very well 
after that first surgery with Dr. Albee, which was my second laparoscopy. About 18 months later, I had some pain, so he went in, and it was just adhesions. Absolutely no endometriosis could be found. We had always suspected that I had adenomyosis, even from the first surgery. And ultimately, in 2007, we went back in, and I had a hysterectomy for adenomyosis. And still, and that was nine and a half years later, there was no endometriosis. I firmly believe that I won't have another problem. Well, the average um, obstetrician gynecologist usually treats endometriosis superficially. Those techniques all treat the disease on the surface. So the surgeon looks at an area that he or she deems to be abnormal and then applies the energy to the surface until the visible characteristics of the disease are gone. Unfortunately, over 80% of the time, the endo isn't completely destroyed. And so that even if a few cells are left untreated, that's enough to allow the endometriosis to persist. And over the course of you know, as, as little as a few weeks to, if you're lucky, you may get a few years worth of benefit from that surgery before the symptoms occur. But in the great majority of patients, that superficial treatment isn't enough. The result of that, though, is that the disease which is deep is generally not treated. And so we get superficial, partial treatment, and oftentimes we get scarring over the surface of the deeper lesions. By using excision, we can make an incision around the area that we suspect endometriosis is in and undermine or you know, cut below the endometrial implants until the entire disease is removed. Unfortunately, we're not 100% accurate at doing that, um, but we're, the, recurrent, the chances of having a recurrence with excision is still only between 7 and 8% based on the you know, 2,500 or so patients that we've operated on. Now, wherever we find anything that looks like endometriosis, we're going to excise it. And the carbon dioxide laser is the tool that we're going to use. So is that like burning it off? No. Matter of fact, that's an important distinction to be made. Burning it off can leave the deep disease behind. What we're going to do is take the laser and outline the lesion, dissect around it, undermine it, lift it out, and send it to pathology. And so we're, we refer to that as excision. By doing that, we're able to be confident that we're not leaving any element of the endometriosis still in your body, that the entire area is removed. I started in my career with a CO2 laser, a carbon dioxide laser, and I really believe that that gives the surgeon the best possible avenue to excise the entire area. I think the biggest challenge we have probably is to encourage surgeons to excise the entire area. And once we can get them, you know, realizing that the long-term studies show that if you excise the entire area, the success rate of getting rid of the endometriosis or having the lowest amount of recurrence and how that also correlates with pain, uh, but on the long term, I mean, years and years out, that they will see that that's why the results here are so great. You can learn a lot just by seeing the process. It's really different than any other process out there. And I think part of the problem now is just a lack of exposure to it. I've had the uh, good fortune of being able to observe the so-called best of the best around the world <laughs> and the different techniques. And I really feel the technique used here, there is no technique any better. I know that there is no cure for endometriosis, but I also know that the best thing we have going for us right now are excisionists, like Dr. Albee and Dr. Sinervo, Dr. Redwine. I think that it's hard to expect the general GYN doctor uh, to do what we do because they are not given an opportunity to have the same amount of repetitive experience. I think that I would want them to encourage them to think about it in young women, in other words, uh, the diagnosis often can be made within the first three years of menarche or starting menstrual periods. And I would encourage them when they make the diagnosis not to hesitate to use laparoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. When they do make the diagnosis, if they can excise the disease, if they're comfortable doing that, that's what we want them to do. If they can excise some of the disease, I would rather have them excise what they can excise and not treat it all what they can't excise 
In other words, my biggest problem that I run into surgically are the partially treated patients. So if a doctor goes in and cauterizes the surface of an area and the deep disease is left there, they've made our job harder. If you go to somebody who doesn't really know how to treat the endometriosis, does not know how to recognize the different ways that endometriosis appears, you will have surgery after surgery. If you find an excisionist, that may be your last. Maybe. I'm not saying definitely because, again, there is no cure. But that is your best bet. November of 07 was when I had my hysterectomy. June of 98 was when I had my laparoscopy for endometriosis with Dr. Albee. To me, that speaks volumes, nine and a half years, and there's not a trace of endo anywhere. You know, we do the most we can, and that's one of our goals, is to teach, to enable other people around the world. We want them to be able to have the opportunity to get this type of treatment. But, you know, we teach, and we're continuing to teach so that we can kind of get, do everything to get the word out to patients as well as to other surgeons. Dr. Albi and I both believe that you're probably born with the endometriosis that you end up, you know, developing on or later on in life. There's multiple causes, and that I think we can be 100% confident of. My own view is that endometriosis is not a chronically reoccurring disease. We find that if we're able to remove all the disease, it's really uncommon for a person to get it again. Right now, all we have is surgery. And I feel that um, although we can't say we've cured our patients of their endo, um, if we are able to get between 80 and 85% of them feeling significantly better um, without having a recurrence of their endo, that's almost as good as a cure. When I woke up from the surgery um, on the car ride home, I was talking to my dad about what the doctor had told him, and he said based on the amount of endometriosis that I had, that I would probably have to have a hysterectomy by the time I was 30. At that point, they started encouraging me to try to have a child because they said that that would relieve the symptoms and that they didn't know um, how long I, or if I would be able to have children. The keys to preserving fertility, I think, are early diagnosis and early and complete and thorough treatment. When endometriosis is treated and it's excised, fertility goes up for patients at all stages of, of the disease. And in women who have the most common form of endo or most common stage being stage two, their chances are almost the same as women who don't have any endo. In our hands, the worst case patients, the stage four patients, we are seeing 49% of those conceive naturally after we excise their disease. After disease excision, in the half that don't conceive, can they still do in vitro? Yeah, they can. For me personally, it's not just a physical condition. Um, it is an emotional condition as well. I do want to have children. and. Just the thought of having something in my body that could prevent me from having children is uh, very scary to me. It seemed very drastic to go all the way down there for this type of surgery when a lot of gynecologists do the same surgery, but I really do believe it was worth it. Even though we did have to travel, I was only out of work for a week before going back. Bad cramping. It's not a normal thing. If you're curled up in your bed two or three days out of the month, even one day out of the month, that's not normal. Maybe this was in my head, but in my heart, I knew that it wasn't normal. And I was waiting for the, the doctor to, to say, this is what's going on with you, but it never came. And I, I didn't really pursue it because I didn't know how to, but I, I always knew that this wasn't normal. I, I always knew that. Um, so it was frustrating to just get told over and over again that, that it was normal and to basically accept it. That was hard to hear. It's been a little bit frustrating. I've had two surgeries already and I really don't want to have to have another one. If it is the way to go, then I guess if that time came, then I would consider it. I guess I'm just tired of, of being on treatment and nobody not really knowing what to do to relieve the symptoms. If you have to fight your insurance company to get the help, it's worth it. Um, 
you know, when you, at least with Dr. Albee, his, his rates are comparable to any other OBGYN out there. And why not go to the best if you can? The right surgical procedure done very carefully has an excellent chance, even if they've had already two surgeries, five surgeries, ten surgeries. The surgery really was life-changing. Even to miss a week, even if it were two weeks of work or school, it really is worth it. The earlier you can catch the endo, the growth will be minimized and it'll be that much less that they'll have to take out. Keep looking. Don't stop. Don't let a doctor tell you it's in your head. You know your own body. If we were to say that uh, now up to 19 or 20 years of follow-up continues to year by year to show us a group that exceeds 80% of patients that have had one surgery and who feel fine and who have not had recurrent surgery, I would call that a cure. Um, I, I would say don't give up the fight. Um, hang in there.